for the invitation. And uh, today, yeah, I'm going to discuss with you about the molecular basis of cardiomyocyte phase determination from rather a quite different angle. So, So actually, um, I have been really obsessed with uh, you know, this question since when I was a grad student. When I, uh, during the time, I was using fruit fly as a model organism to study how the progenitor cells, pallet progenitor cells, were specified and differentiated to form a functional beeping heart tube. And later on, during my postdoc, I further fascinated by the, how the pluripotent stem cell uh, can be differentiated into multi-lineages, including cardiac cell. And later on, was even amazed by how a fully differentiated somatic cell, such as fibroblasts, get directly converted into cardiomyocyte-like cell. Really based, uh, you know, based on my training and experience as a cardiac programmer and reprogrammer, and I was able to uh, start my own laboratory, really, send, really trying to uh, address the question, that is, what does it really take to make a functional cardiomyocyte? And we believe by addressing this question, the outcome can really help us further understanding the basic biology of cell plasticity, cell stability, cell fate determination, uh, the existence of potential cell intermediates, and also the epigenetics, and ultimately help us understand the cell identity. So in fact, over the years, well, during my first four to five years uh, as a junior faculty, so we built upon our early studies uh, where we demonstrate the endogenous cardiac fibroblasts can be converted into a uh, cardiomyocyte-like cell and uh, really leverage the knowledge from developmental biology and characterize the stoichiometrical requirement of the reprogramming factor and also study epigenetic regulation in particular, identify the epigenetic barrier to cardiac reprogramming. And I'm very happy my previous uh, postdoc, Yang Zhou, uh, who is currently already assistant professor at UAB, also at this meeting. And he, she actually did most of the work for the epigenetic characterization. So she's the expert. Feel free to talk to her. And uh, we also generate a lot of tools for cardiac reprogramming. And we'd like to let you guys know, especially we recently deposited the most popular and frequently uh, requested plasmid to adjunct. So just play around with them and let, it, let us know if you have any question. Um, so uh, oh, a little bit over a year ago, we also used a single cell transcriptomics approach to reconstruct um, the conversion process from fibroblasts to uh, cardiomyocytes. And uh, using not only the uh, single cell uh, RNA seq but also mathematical modeling and a lot of experimental uh, validation and characterization, we addressed the many uh, uh, biological questions we actually collected over the year about cardiac reprogramming. But the most rewarding thing is we uh, uh, identified the importance, discovered the importance of RNA splicing during the conversion from fibroblasts to ICM. And in particular, we actually characterize the splicing factor PDBP1 during this conversion. And this work was really led by three uh, incredibly talented uh, co three co-first author. And uh, Zixin already became a research faculty in the Department of Biology at UNC. And Josh Welch also started his own laboratory at the University of Michigan and uh, continue their fascinating work. So based on the, really the single cell work uh, we did uh, in the in vitro system, we realized that the relative low efficiency and part the, also the heterogeneity of this conversion process, at least in part due to the rather heterogeneous starting population, that is cardiofibroblasts. So we decided now really move uh, back to the in vivo system and study the heterogeneity and the possible uh, uh, composition of the cardiac fibroblasts for optimal targeted reprogramming. So really nice to follow both Burns and uh, Richard's uh, talk. So we indeed did a lot, also a lot of single cell RNA seq on uh, cardiac non-myocytes using the mouse, adult mouse heart. So this work is really led by another uh, postdoc Li Wang and uh, also our uh, bioinformatician Yu Chen Yang and also help from a couple other members in the lab. So 
so far, I think there are two papers already published in the field. Possibly Burns and Richard probably will publish also very soon. Uh, so the first paper was really in cell report uh, last year and from Pinto and Rosenthal group. And for the, in this paper, they basically chopped ventricle out and mixed them into small pieces. And after I enzyme digestion, so they pre-sort, uh, well, pre did the pre-sorting to exclude most of the endothelial cell, and then uh, let those cells go through the 10x genomic sequencing for the high throughput single cell only sick. And in the other paper from Eva Varou's group, so also uh, published also last year in circulation, so they used a rather traditional method and using the Langendorf system to perfuse uh, the heart, but they also chopped the, uh, the, the, uh, the heart tissue into small pieces. And rather than using the 10x genomic system, so they send the, uh, send the uh, cells for a pretty deep RNA sequencing and total end up with uh, 462 cells, uh, including many of the cardiomyocytes from three healthy uh, white type hearts. And also Pinto group, uh, the data show they are actually combine all the cells, the 10, over 10,000 cells from the two hearts. So all the data demonstrate there was a combined result. So we try to balance uh, the quantity and quality. So in our approach, we also use the Langendorf system to perfuse the heart and use the constant temperature and constant concentration of the enzyme to digest the cells but keep them still in, in, in intact uh, on the Langendorf apparatus. And then, rather than chopping them into small pieces, we used a, a series of ultracentrifugation to separate the non mycite from mycite. And after putting the red blood cell lysis and also live cell dye, and we used the fax sorting to further narrow down them by the cell size and sent for only, uh, single cell only sick, and also used the 10x genomic system. So, you know, really after character, um, identify the difference in methodology, we also find there is a, a lot of challenge in data analysis and also experimental design. For example, what really defines a biological replicate in such experiment? Do you define that as one sequencing or one heart or pull the cells from multiple hearts? And also how to correct batch effect? Really what is a batch? Uh, related is also the data normalization, QCs, and data trimming. So uh, I, I have shown this slide probably over a year ago. So we indeed sequenced many hearts. So there are some examples from nine adult hearts, Y-type. And uh, there is an interesting correlation you can see. So there is an anti-correlation between the number of cells you sequence with the uh, mean reads per cells. And of course, when the reads reach to a saturated level, so it actually become mature, uh, saturated and you won't get uh, further information. But for example, the cell, this mouse here, the data, uh, although you sequenced like uh, over 12,000 cells, but the mean reads and also the detection uh, number of genes detect per cell is pretty terrible. And if you pull out the data, so there is a lot of bad, uh, noise. So we have to really, you know, uh, discard the data from this uh, mouse. So in the end, we find really probably the best way to uh, show the data and also to validate data is to using one representative heart and uh, validate the uh, clustering and the biological findings in other uh, hearts or the, the single cells from other hearts. So if, for example, here, is the single cell on a sick from one heart. And this is the best, uh, the, the most representative one because we can validate all the clustering and the, the markers uh, in, the, uh, in the single cell data from other hearts. And uh, again, you've probably already seen several like TISNI data. Again, this is a TISNI data, but use the sure code, uh, uh, sure right method to cluster the cells. And using the clustering method, so the computational algorithm give you 18 clusters. So this is unbiased, all by computational approach. But then how do we categorize them into main population is pure based on our knowledge. So this is based on the markers that's been published in the past and also the geo terms that are enriched in those cell populations. So then you can roughly categorize, sub, uh, divide those 18 populations to four major populations, or maybe four or five. Um, but the next step, I think it's the most difficult and challenging step for people in the field. That is how to define the subpopulation in 
each main population. Because you see that the known marker of all express all in this, those subpopulation. For example, cardiophyobas. How, why we call them cardiophyobas? Because all based on the known markers. And um, by Tisney, at the short uh, algorithm, we clearly see the three populations within the fibroblast major cell type. But if you try to use all the novel markers that's already pu being published, no matter they are surface marker, lineage marker, or the cardiofibroblast regulators, so thanks for to this really nice uh, review paper from Michelle Tauke's lab. So when you look at that, so all the novel markers express in all the subpopulations. And the expression level kind of similar, especially between some of the subgroups. So how really, how to define those subpopulations and categorize them? So uh, Li Wang and Yu Chen are quite creative in a way. Instead of using the traditional clustering method, they start to use the trajectory toolkits and purely let the mathematical algorithm to categorize the cells by themselves. So this is completely unsupervised. It's a machine learning method, and they didn't define the starting or ending points on the trajectory. And now they see actually three uh, branches in this, uh, 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 in this trajectory. And uh, the three branches they call the states. And in fact, the three states can correlate back to the three subpopulation of the fibroblasts. And uh, most interestingly, now you have this uh, uh, trajectory, and you can do the GO terms based on the trajectory. And now this time, the three states corresponding to the three subpopulations can be characterized by their functions. So you can see that the first state really enriched in geo terms of cellular response. Cellular response to chemo uh, taxes, to drugs, to stimuli, to hypoxia. And the second state really related to cytoskeleton. So we are familiar with like such as uh, extracellular matrix organization, uh, so re regulation of focal adhesion, cytoskeleton uh, organization. And the third state have the most enriched term in immune response. So this really gives us a very exciting hypothesis. We've, you know, based on all this data we, we come up with, because all the previous functions um, I mentioned are Sounds all familiar to you guys. And we know Kanye Fiber Wars executes those functions, but we don't know how they execute those functions and uh, through what kind of molecular pathway. So now we propose that the multiple function of Kanye Fiber Wars may be separately ac ac executed by the different subpopulation of fiber bars that are distinct in their morphology, molecular signature, and cellular function. And of course, there are a lot to be done to really prove or disapprove this hypothesis. So we need to define the populations with their functionality that I already show you. But more importantly, we have to really show you guys those subpopulations do exist. And we can find exclusive marker for each state slash subpopulation. And of course, followed by functional study. So we went back to the data and you know, go, to, go back to the fibroblast state one. Again, use uh, the pseudo time um, uh, the trajectory toolkit analysis, and now find the top enriched gene uniquely expressed in this state. Those genes not, not really uh, look familiar to you guys. And the top enriched gene is this HSD11B1. So this gene has been barely studied in cardiac fields. So the review paper uh, we found actually is from a uh, uh, Journal of Molecular Endocrinology, and the people outside of our field did a very preliminary study of the gene and uh, claimed that this gene actually expressed in all major types of the, uh, in the heart, mostly in reaching fibroblasts, and mainly involved in immune response and angiogenesis. And um, the straight now mice have a, a, a little bit smaller heart. So we decided to really look at it, what happened. So this is the localization of this state one specific mark. So it's kind of, you know, it's expressed around the cardiomyocyte. And it's very unique it's in, its, oh, okay, in, in its size. And it's relatively small around and not like what we're seeing with the typical cardiofibobus. And when we co-label with other markers, they never co-label with alpha-actinine, cardiomyocytes, most muscle cell, and endocinian cells. 
and they also partially co-localize with the pain fibroblast markers such as mementin. Then when we look at the state two gene, the most enriched gene is also very surprising. So this is the GFPT2 is the top gene. But as we're involved in glycosylation, it's a, really has nothing to do with the, our, our known fibroblast gene, but really the top enriching only study under the context of cancer. So what we find is it's also enriched very specifically in cardiac fibroblasts. And, uh, and in the, uh, you can see in the left ventricle and also in the right ventricle, co -localized, partially co-localized with mementin. And uh, they never co-localize with cardiomyocytes, smooth muscle, and endothelium cells. So this is really, you know, the second step uh, towards our hypothesis. And the, the group three, I want to sh the, tell you guys, that this is very similar to what Pinto and the Rosenthal's group identify as the fibrocytes, because they express both fibroblast marker and also immune cell markers. So we uh, didn't do much further on this group because I think it's very interesting uh, cell population other groups also study. So we are, con we are in the process of generating the flux allele, pre ER allele, and also the, the suicides, uh, the knocking alleles for this uh, two top candidate gene. I'm very excited to continue testing our hypothesis. And we also uh, want to know whether the states actually shift or interchangeable with age, with injury. So we have already collected data with age, but we try to understand what's re what does those mean. So we also continue upgrading our mathematical modeling, and our slides are now already upgraded to the spatial to incorporate the temporal information. And uh, with that, I want to just... Uh, Final message is we continue using the traditional uh, approaches uh, using model, uh, model animals, but also we try to embrace the modern technology using the single cell omics, mathematical modeling, and machine learning and AI, and try to understand biology at a very high resolution and hopefully can help, finally help uh, the patients. So with that, I believe I already acknowledge the people who did the work, but we really want to thank all the wonderful collaborators and funding source and UNC core facilities. And thank you for your attention. The paper is open for question. on the your cell um, anatomical location based on your anatomical location mm -hmm. and uh, uh, expression of your 11 beta HSD. Yes. Yep. They look very similar to the PDGF receptor alpha cells that yeah. you find. Yeah. Uh, so they are sort of non-vascular interstitial close to my side. So probably we are talking about the same cells that yes. Rachel yes. has presented. I, I agree with you because when, actually that's uh, uh, can very likely to be the PDGF alpha. So then the PDGF alpha also expressing all the three states of our cells. So we are wondering maybe this uh, mark actually mark part of the PDGF alpha cells. So we are going to continue to do the linear tracing and also co-label with additional fibroblast markers. So yeah, thanks for the comments. Yeah. Okay, thanks.